uh, Portuguese Beyond Borders Institute's uh, events as far as our oral history program. So we have got literally uh, now hundreds of uh, hours recorded, and we're putting them up on our library archive um, a few at a time. We have about 55 so, five, uh, so far archived, and um, this conversation certainly is one that's going to be in our archive as well, transcribed and for future generations. Our guest is Tony Goulart, uh, who uh, does not need an introduction. I know that that's a lazy way of an, of an in, of someone who is moderating a panel to say, because then they don't feel they have no responsibility as far as saying some things about the guest. But Tony is widely known in the Portuguese American community. I, I'm going to ask him to tell us a little bit about himself and his uh, immigration to um, uh, California from the island of Pico and other islands where he's lived in the Azores as well, and, and his trajectory over to America. Um, he's been the key figure in the Portuguese American community of the Bay Area. He's been involved in many organizations, has done conferences for the Luso American Education Foundation, was one of the key figures in creating the Portuguese Chamber of Commerce of Silicon Valley in California. Um, of course, uh, and our topic for the conversation today, the Portuguese uh, Heritage Publications of California and uh, the publishing and archiving of the Portuguese American uh, experience in this state uh, that, of course, uh, the uh, the soul and, and, and the thriving force behind it has been always Tony Goulart, uh, along with a couple of the folks as well, José, José Rodrigues, amongst others. And um, and also, he's been involved in many other community projects. The Conselho das Comunidades was, I believe, him and and José João, the late José João Encarnação, were the first to be elected before the before then it was kind of a community event that the community organizations elected. But um, they ran a campaign where, where it was it was I believe to this day to the most successful uh, and uh, and and uh, he's smiling, but it was the most successful uh, Portuguese. Um, um, Portuguese uh, political uh, campaign, uh, although not partisan uh, political campaign, because there were literally, I think, thousands of votes or, or in the high hundreds, hundreds. anyway. And in the high hundreds, in the high hundreds, compared to some of the other ones who uh, lately, I think the people have been elected with seven votes or nine votes or 11. Um, so, Tony, um, thanks so much for uh, taking the time as we commemorate uh, Portuguese Immigrant Week, and uh, more important as we also archive our Portuguese American experience in California. A little bit about your trajectory from Pico to, to America. Well, first of all, thank you for the invitation, and it's a pleasure to be part of this uh, struggle to continue to keep our um, Portuguese community and its memories alive. Um, my trajectory started uh, with when I was born in Pico and uh, what I call the capital of Pico, San Catan. It was the last village to have um, uh, running water and electricity in Pico. That's why I call it the capital. It's between two um, uh, districts, the Lages and Madalena, and because we don't belong to almost anyone. Uh, we stay in the middle of the mountains in a little bay, a beautiful bay. And uh, so I was born uh, in the early 50s and um, attended after uh, elementary school, I attended the seminary in Ponta Delgada for five years and then uh, in Angra for four. Um, but um, at which time I realized that probably my call had been uh, kind of forcefully uh, impregnated in my mind rather than uh, a clear choice. And uh, since my family lived in the, in the United States, more, more particularly in California, they had immigrated. Um, funny enough, and I will interject a, a little interesting story that um, uh, in order for me to stay in the seminary and my family, because uh, all the siblings were all minor, to immigrate as a unit, I had to be um, proven not to be part of the family. So um, my father was a regidor of the Frexia um, and uh, engaged into this false document that I was an illegitimate son of the family. And so um, with all that and with God in mind and the priesthoods and the horizon, I stayed back and my 
siblings uh, moved on to California five years before I did, uh, when I joined them later on in 1974. Um, since um, I wasn't able to accomplish what I had set out to, which would be to, to uh, go into uh, some, kind of, some kind of an educational course, which had been my, uh, my previous years of occupation. Um, I always ran out of money. I, I uh, registered for a computer programming class uh, that I had to pay every two weeks. Uh, about 60% through the course, I ran out of money and I had to drop out. Um, the teachers were very upset with, you, with my decision, but uh, it was determined by exactly that, that, um, such, that financial situation. Um, then I tried getting into San Jose State. Of course, I had immigrated on a visitor's visa and uh, um, uh, to attend San Jose State, I would have to improve my English skills, which are still a little um, poor at this, after all these years. But um, I registered for a school um, at, the, at the suggestion of Father Lionel Noya, who had attended that same school when he first arrived in the United States. And the teacher was Valley Alvarez, a, a Greek teacher with a very heavy accent, but uh, that could prepare instantly almost uh, is her students to uh, take the TOEFL test. I did and passed it with flying colors, thanks to her. Um, and uh, so I immediately thought of um, uh, taking some classes at San Jose State. I went and registered with a full load, 18 units. And I was informed that uh, each one of the units would cost approximately $350 for a resident and $750 for a foreign student, which was my classification. So I couldn't afford it. I attended San Jose State for about two months or two and a half months until I was able to withdraw so that would not impact my 4.0 average that I had been uh, transferred from the Azores. And um, it was that frustrating feeling of uh, not having a possibility to continue studying here in the United States. And so one day my brothers who worked in construction uh, uh, came home and, and said that um, the company was hiring a couple of people, uh, and uh, but they were not by any stretch of imagination in, uh, suggesting that I would take that on. And But I said, um, do you think I could... Uh, I, I could do the job and I could uh, I could be one of the candidates. They said, well, you've been studying all your life. What do you know about construction and that's heavy work and all that? You'll never make it and so forth. But I said, well, I'm sick and tired of running out of money. I need the money. And uh, wages were, uh, union wages at that time, were very enticing. So um, I worked uh, with my brother for West Coast Drywall and Hayward for three and a half years until we established ourselves in, uh, with our own operation, which lasted 33 years uh, in a partnership with my, my older, one of my older brothers. Um, and but it's good to say that meanwhile, as you had your own company and a very successful one, um, you also went back to education. You, you, you have your bachelor's and your master's. And yes, uh, yeah. yes. And um, before, um, when we were a little bit more comfortable financially in the business, uh, I always had this dream of completing because I had never finished my bachelor's degree. So I, I went and registered at USF and completed my bachelor's. And I was so enthusiastic about it that uh, the week after I graduated um, from the bachelor's, I registered on the master's program. So I completed um, with a, a, a little interruption, which was caused by family issues um, and uh, life decisions. I ended up uh, only completing my master's at uh, the beautiful age of 40 some years old uh, when I was um, 
I think 1996, I believe. And, uh, but I accomplished that, uh, not for a whole lot of promotions at work because that would not impact uh, my situation. But I felt that I had to do it especially as an inspiration for my two children. Um, that I have from my first marriage. In the second marriage, uh, we have two children. They are not blood children, but uh, we treat each other like if we were. And uh, I love that relationship. Uh, and so uh, my master's, pro my master's uh, project was um, focused on the establishment of a Portuguese uh, Chamber of Commerce. Mm -hmm. I had known that back in the 1905, before the San Francisco earthquake, there had been um, a Portuguese Chamber of Commerce located in San Francisco, but that was short-lived. I would think mainly because of the consequences of the earthquake um, and that disband. But I thought that we had the Portuguese community uh, throughout the state at such uh, a huge um, um, place and had taken such a, uh, a major contributing, it had been such a, a major contributing factor to the history of this, this state. And people were, um, fairly, I would say to the majority, uh, referring to the majority of our people, they were fairly successful, financially successful. And uh, I thought, well, we probably never took advantage of that um, financial uh, status uh, in order to, uh, to have our voices heard. And so my project was, uh, was based on uh, working on the concept of creating a Portuguese Chamber of Commerce, which came to fruition in 1981 and lasted about 13 years, even though only the first seven or eight, I was uh, more directly and more deeply I was kicked out on the eighth year, uh, no, it was on the 10th year that I was kicked out and made uh, an honorary president so that I would not have a, a voting, um, a, a, a voting um, um, uh, presence. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was exactly at that time, the 10th anniversary of the chamber, because the chamber was originally established as Portuguese Chamber of Commerce of uh, Silicon Valley or of, uh, of um, Santa Clara County, uh, that there was this intention of expanding it throughout California because some of the heavyweight financial heavyweights of our community were scattered throughout the state. And we wanted also to expand the concept to other areas of, uh, of, the, of the state. Um, and that was when um, another little project uh, showed up in the horizons. And we thought, well, how can we introduce the concept to the other communities uh, without um, a business card, for example, to break the ice and to say, what, uh, what are we about? And so we thought of celebrating the 10th anniversary of the chamber with a publication of what would have been probably a hundred page booklet about the Holy Ghost celebrations in California, uh, which would be uh, our uh, introduction to the rest of the state. And, um, and they would have been um, the compilation of what, the, what our common history uh, on the religious social aspect was. And uh, so we started working on that and uh, organized uh, research groups by geographical areas. And uh, um, the project just embellished to a point that we ended up um, publishing a 500 page book. Um, it's probably poor in quality as far as the, the content, but it is an inventory. 
Just go ahead. An inventory, it, huh? You were saying it's it's an inventory of uh, of a major um, aspect of our um, of our presence here in California. So that that was such a beautiful, beautifully interesting project by involving over two hundred people that, with more or less skills. Um, uh, contributed as writers to the to the project, uh, and also from a financial standpoint. Yes, that's for, for those who've that never we, seen it. This is we, not a, a small book. Okay, this yeah, is not the hundred pages that Tony said. Yeah, like I'm, Denise I'm, used to, like the, Denise used to jokingly uh, mention uh, that we sold uh, culture by the by the kilo. Yeah, but it's uh, but it's true. It is by the pound because it's it, it's weighs hard. But it's a yeah, it's, but it's it's a beautiful book. It's a beautiful book. The, the, the idea behind it is I remember very vividly when I first arrived in the United States that. My parents, just like so many other folks that I visited their homes, and this is not a criticism, it's just a, a, reality, a, a reality, a fact of reality that uh, most of them had the Yellow Pages book at home, and probably no other book, uh, maybe a little a handwritten uh, telephone directory of their own, but there were uh, not many books present in, uh, and when I look in the, uh, uh, in your background and see a bookshelf um, uh, behind you, I, I didn't, that was not my experience when I arrived here in the, in the seventies. That, that wasn't mine would, either. It would, <laughs> would even be a, a little uh, souvenir book on top of a, uh, of a table. So, I remember talking to Alam Dolivera and I, and uh, and discussing this uh, and uh, wondering whether people were going to read it or people were going to be interested and uh, and basically saying if they don't care for it at least it will be a nice decorating piece for their coffee tables in their living rooms. Uh, it was deeply insulted with the with the concept, but that was also one of the ideas behind it is that people would replace that yellow pages book with something of their own history on their own history literally you uh, had hundred you had dozens of people collaborate with you on that project yeah we had over 200 people that contributed in, with writing and uh, doing some research some of them uh, just facilitated the research and visited uh, different areas. And I think we did the complete on the first edition. We missed one uh, Holy Ghost celebration uh, in Southern California. Um, I believe that the north of Oxnard. Oxnard, I believe that we missed it. And then when we went for the second edition, um, uh, we included that, uh, that one that we had uh, uh, unwillingly missed. Uh, but the, the support that we received for that project was just phenomenal. Even though we had um, no tempo das vacas gordas, or uh, at the time of the fat cows um, uh, and finances that the communities were looked upon with um, with a different with a different set of eyes. Caixa uh, Geral Depósitos, through uh, my friend uh, Ataíde Marques, Professor Ataíde Marques, now at the Universidade uh, Universidade Católica. Um, uh, supported us with $20,000, uh, which was matched by FLAD, uh, the Luz American Development Foundation, uh, with another 20000 But among the, the Portuguese community, I remember that after we had sold 65, sold or distributed, because we distributed a lot to public libraries and, and organizations that uh, at no cost to them, but we had uh, approximately a little over $100,000 in the bank. This is after all expenses paid, after um, uh, having uh, gone through 6,500 copies of a book, which I think short of um, 
of uh, August Vaz's book is probably the record for Portuguese sure. books in sure. California. Sure um, and so there were a hundred thousand dollars, but as because we had established this accounting through the Portuguese Chamber of Commerce as a sub committee uh, uh, of theirs for the uh, 10th year anniversary, um, uh, the chamber ran out of funds and started going to the funds that had been assigned specifically just to cover the book. And if there was any leftover monies, they would be distributed in scholarships. And because there was no funding, so they started going at it. And I flipped, um, as, um, not very often, but sometimes I do. And um, they kicked me out and um, they tried to keep the money. And uh, we were able to negotiate through our dear friends, José Rodrigues and Al Dutra, much more patient to, uh, with, uh, with these kind of community endeavors and much more appeasing um, to uh, split up those proceeds and start a new organization called Portuguese, uh, uh, Portuguese Heritage Publications. And then the story goes on. Um, uh, we had come across um, a lot of references um, uh, uh, during our Holy Ghost uh, book um, preparations. We had come across Al Graves' work, and um, and it was intriguing that uh, nobody knew where Al Graves was any longer. If he was still active, if he was teaching, if uh, because he had done his master's and PhD about the Portuguese uh, Portuguese in agriculture, and uh, so we um, we were able to track him down. He was a banker, an investment banker in Fresno at the time, and. Um, uh, of course, not connected to uh, the academic world anymore, but um, uh, he found the idea interesting of publishing his master's and the uh, PhD thesis. And so we um, we met in Los Vanos uh, because he figured that if this was a waste of his time, at least he would not come all the way to San Jose and we would meet halfway. Uh, being as pragmatic as he is, and sometimes as um, shrewd as he is, um, I agreed to it, and we met at a coffee shop in Los Vanos, and we agreed to proceed with uh, with this book. Again, the funding portion of it was was very generous. Uh, people were very generous. And Al, Grave, Al Graves took 10 months off of his work, of his job to uh, re rework uh, what was previously a thesis, an academic thesis, and uh, bring it into a more attractive, more popular concept of uh, the book presentation. And uh, so that was another significant um, significant milestone for Portuguese Heritage Publications, which sold uh, two editions of the book, 4,500 copies. And uh, I just wish we had uh, not made the end, uh, not we had, that we had not underestimated uh, how popular this book would become. Um, because I recall it, it was the only time in Tulare that people would take three and four books at a time. I'm not saying that then it's never happened in the American community. I've been to book presentations here as well, but it was uh, the museum was just packed, as you might recall, and people yeah, people yeah. outside. Um, yeah. And uh, and uh, and when we first talked about that with the Sister City Foundation, we thought, well, you know, if we can get, you know, 100 people in there, that's already a lot. But I mean, the thing was packed and people outside and and people were actually buying the book and uh, not yeah, just yeah. one. Some people would. I was I was very yeah, surprised. It was, it was one of the most amazing book presentations that we've done. I remember that I even. Uh, and my slip of the tongue on, uh, I was so surprised with the turnout, with uh, and the level of people that showed up, uh, the interest of the people uh, that showed up, that I started by saying that I was appalled 
And uh, that was not the right word. It was exactly the opposite that, that I wanted to convey, but uh, uh, my poor English still uh, uh, was, not, um, was not my best friend at that particular moment. But so, uh, so that then uh, we proceeded uh, uh, to, to, uh, to uh, other projects. And we've heard of um, we had heard of uh, David Bertel, who uh, who was um, a researcher. He was a mailman, uh, but had previously dedicated a lot of his time uh, through the inspiration uh, by the inspiration of our dear friend Mayan Diaz to do a research on uh, coastal whaling and uh, and the 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 the. the, the the Portuguese involvement in coastal whaling. So David took 15 years of his life, basically, going through every little coastal town of California, the, even the most remote ones, to uh, gather information about um, the Portuguese pioneers that first arrived here and did, did, did not dedicate themselves to um, to uh, farming or to gold exploration, but that set, uh, but the ones that settled in the coastal towns, a lot of them uh, got involved in uh, uh, shore whaling, um, a very primitive uh, uh, methods uh, were used at the time. But uh, David had this research and um, he had uh, thoroughly searched the possibility of, of uh, of um, publishing it, but nobody wanted to take it on because it was um, a very delicate subject in first place because of the Protection Act uh, of the Wales that was still very fresh in people's minds. And also because it only accounted for shore whaling, not American whaling at large, which is a subject dear to a lot more people. And uh, so we said, yeah, well, we'll we'll take it on. Unfortunately, the the demand for that book was not as high as some of the previous ones, uh, and we are still trying to sell the book and uh, trying to at this point because we are in the process of dissolving Portuguese Heritage Publications. Uh, we're trying to just put it on hands that will care about the topic and about the presence of the Portuguese in California. If I may just add, uh, this book is so interesting, uh, not only because it accounts for 26 whaling stations along the California coast, not all of them manned and operated by Portuguese, but most were, and but it has also about a hundred page of uh, 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 biographical information about these pioneers, most of them probably that didn't even know how to read or write, but he was able to, uh, by digging into uh, all kinds of sources from the census to um, uh, payroll, uh, payroll records, to uh, find some information and uh, see their connection to their roots back in the Azores. <laughs> it so is I indeed say, a, yeah it's a fascinating book i mean it's just really fascinating I, it, it's, it one of, it's one of it my is. favorites to be honest with you it is then we went on to do um uh, during the the 50th uh, the the 50th anniversary of the volcano dos Capelinhos, uh, uh dr alzida silva who was the director of immigration services of the azores suggested that uh, if we wanted to participate in a project to publish uh, a book about the impact of the um, of, of the wave of Caplinia's immigration uh, in the United States, and that's the, the that was one of our major uh, research works uh, that that uh, um, that. Um, had cont contributions from experts in uh, in the Azores, uh, writers in the in the American diaspora, both in the East Coast and California, and uh, it was also 
a very interesting project to work in and uh, because it's it, it basically um, touches upon the, the second wave of immigration, what I call the second wave of immigration from the Azores to the United States. Um, and so uh, during this course of, uh, and then we, we published several other books, one that comes to mind by Maria Carti, Maria Cunha Carti, um, as a graduate from uh, from Berkeley, uh, about the IES uh, IES Centennial, um, another one about the Five Wounds Centennial, uh, which was coordinated by Miguel Avila, and um, during the, the that period of time, we also engaged into the publication of other collections, whether in English or Portuguese. That refer that uh, that referred or uh, add uh, the uh, Amer uh, the Portuguese experience in California as the main thrust, and um, so we published in the in this period of approximately twenty plus years about thirty five books. Uh, the last one was oh. Uh, yeah, since you you brought that, I just up. brought this one up, Tony. Because I, I think that yeah, this, this I, book I is very yeah. on, on that. This one this, this book has I, been very overlooked, unfortunately. And uh, not I'm not not by you guys. You guys publish it, but sometimes by the public. I think it's a it, it's a history. And and if I want to just to take it back to the before we we get to this the uh, volcano, um, uh, um, the Kaplingus book. Uh, uh, you know, one of our and you and I have talked about this in the past uh, several times, uh, one of our uh, contributions uh, and one of the things that have kept the Portuguese American community and I think the Portuguese language alive were the radio programs. If we didn't have the radio programs in the 1960s and 70s, especially because then technology changes, you and I both know in the late 80s, yeah. but yeah. up until then, if we didn't have the Portuguese radio programs, if they didn't exist, Portuguese people wouldn't speak English. I mean, I mean Portuguese. You know, most of them would have turned to English to survive, of course, and to know, you know, news and everything else. Um, and to this date, uh, the Kapolinus book, uh, by publishing the work that was originally uh, researched by Dr. Fernando Silva, and I think Jose Rodrigues worked on it as well. It has uh, one of the best, I wouldn't say one, I would say the best uh, 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 exposition of right. the history of the Portuguese radio in California in this yeah. book. Correct yeah, me if I'm wrong. The, yeah, in the media. So there are there yeah. are quite a few interesting areas that were uh, brought into perspective how impactful this wave of immigration that started in the 60s impacted and uh, regenerated the Portuguese American community in California. So um, yeah, and uh, one of one of the other topics uh, that was quite interesting, and it was also uh, research uh, paid by uh, Flad um, uh, directly to the author uh, Alvin Graves, because we could not afford to pay uh, his rights on, on the previous books or any other books. We just gave a token of appreciation after uh, to all the authors, uh, research auth authors, uh, but nothing uh, compared to what uh, Flat could contribute. And Al uh, did a great job in getting together all the political figures, uh, uh, whether past or uh, current at the time, uh, to summarize their um, legislative efforts and their legis legislative lives. And it's quite a rich, uh, quite a rich history uh, that goes back to our first uh, immigrants one from Pico that comes to mind um, that uh, was elected to, uh, to John, John G. Matos. I just featured him. We're featuring something uh, all week John long G. called John G. Matos in the Picarot from the Santo Picarot. Antonio. Yes, uh, yes, uh, Christian, Christian, uh, Christian. H. E. H. E. Christian. Yeah. Um, I just uh, we're using the book. I'm using the book uh, to do something called profiles in legislative service during this whole week. Uh, profiling and using the, the the book as a source because it's a wonderful source. I recall having a conversation with uh, with uh, Al about this, and uh, uh, he was just you know he said uh, when he was working on this, and I recall him telling me that I'm going to have to stick with only the legislature because I mean if I, 
if, if I start digging into municipalities and supervisors and 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 county boards of this and county boards of that, I mean, it's gonna it's a humongous project. Yeah. And thank God that Al took this on. Uh, and as I mentioned today in the talk, I believe, you know, and I'd love to find some master students who are going into public policy or, or you know, in the political science world, because there is a lot to uncover uh, that yeah. Al had began to uncover. But like you said, I have to stick to only one or else it's going to be like, you know, yeah. thousands yeah. of pages. Because but we do need to do some work uh, in, the, the county, in that level. At the county yeah. level, yeah. Yeah. At, the county county level. level yeah. at the city level with the... Um, with city council members and school boards, there is an important, I mean, an important in the tremendous amount of people that have uh, got involved and not uh, basically with the banner of being Portuguese, but as members of the, of the community that accepted us and that we live in, um, but with those roots traced back to their uh, Azorian Portuguese families. <laughs> Tony, can we uh, look at uh, a little bit? Uh, so as you were talking about, there's um, you guys decided to, at one point, uh, you and, and, and the team there decided to do different collections. So we talked a little bit about the heritage collection. And, uh, and we're looking at these here. Uh, those of us who are follow following us, uh, the fiction collection, pioneer collection, and then Decimedia collection with Colossal Decimedia, which I, of course is in Portuguese. Um, and uh, what was the main, the main purpose for dividing these different collections? What were you trying to achieve with, with, with some of this? Well, the, the fish, all the other collections were mainly uh, authors that had uh, some writings that we thought were worth uh, publishing or translating in uh, you have uh, you helped us tremendously with uh, the translation of I no longer like chocolates from Alam Oliveira and uh, we thought those were worthwhile stories related to the history of the presence of the Portuguese in California, but we were being just instrumental in helping the authors either publish in English or uh, divulge their their works. Uh, I'm looking at uh, the slide that you just have with the, the cow uh, mm -hmm. for the Holy Spirit, which is kind of an interesting um a rural experience of yeah, uh, I, I like of, that book a lot too. Ma many of our immigrants went through, mm -hmm. uh, 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 which was written by Rose Silva King, and which had a tremendous success. But it's an author's edition with the stamp of Portuguese heritage. Of course, we helped design it uh, and uh, and put it out on the on the to the public eye, uh, but those were mainly authors' um, editions. Uh, the same thing with A Barrel Full of Memories. It was a book that had been published and, um, and they had been, uh, um, uh, I mean, printed, the first printing by Pauline Stonehill, and uh, she never marketed it uh, to a point that it was attractive enough. So we changed the cover, we, we uh, reformatted the book, and uh, it was an instant success story too. The same thing with the egg in the, in the water glass from Olivia Lage uh, that sold out in a fairly quick quick uh, time, but it was mo more dependent on the activity of, um, of the authors themselves and the promotion uh, uh, everywhere in California. Uh, and then we had uh, a book that had, pu had been published by uh, José Brits from uh, um, Brits, yeah, from, from Rhode Island somewhere. I don't know exactly where, but Rhode Island, yes. Yeah, yes. from Rhode Island. <laughs> José uh, is uh, now living in Portugal, but while he was in, um, in the United States, he had a little um, uh, uh, publishing company. Yeah, yeah. And very, very, very utopian, José, and yeah. uh, lost a lot of money on it, but he just kept on going. But it was interesting. I came across this, this little booklet, and I saw that the first edition was 250 pages. Mm -hmm. I mean, 250 copies, uh, right. to be correct. And, um, and I, I thought, wow, what a 
what a little precious uh, nugget piece of information uh, in only 250 copies, but Jose was in the East Coast and so he could not really uh, do much with the with a promotion of this Portuguese presence in California by Eduardo Mayon Dias. I still think to this date is the most concise, the most mm -hmm. interesting introduction to the Portuguese history in California that one can put their hands on. And so we uh, we printed the first, um, we did the first printing. Um, it was a, a kind of a, orange, a yellowish cover mm -hmm. and uh, we just started distributing by schools, by bands, by band uh, during the band festival, annual band festivals, uh, because we thought it was not a very, a, a very easy reading. Uh, because uh, Mayandia divided it up in very small chapters about the main uh, areas of um, of interference of the Portuguese in California, and so we're still thinking that. We might just, on this later phase of our existence, of doing a reprint and just spreading it out. I know that the book probably needed a little um, updating, especially because this was written probably, I would suppose, in the 80s. Yeah, yeah I think it was late. late first published in the 80s. Yeah, yeah. I think it was uh, late 80s when it was written. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so it probably is a little dated, but um, until then, I think it's an interesting, uh, it's a very interesting book. Then we had the Coleção Decima Ilha, which was um, um, a collection of books from uh, Portuguese authors, uh, the major a lot of them uh, poets, José Luís da Silva, Maria dos Dores Beirão, uh, Lécio Oliveira, um, and we did it mainly because either the, these people were associated with Portuguese heritage and because they also represented um, represented a slice of our American experience. Um, I have to mention that uh, our friend Vasco Pereira da Costa, we also, uh, with your help and, uh, and uh, Catherine's, uh, um, Catherine Baker, we published uh, our um, uh, Vasco Pereira da Costa's My California Friends, which has very interesting poems about his experience in the in the is in his uh, in his trips to California. Um, so it's, and I and I recall you were apprehensive. Can I tell a story? I recall you were apprehensive about this publication because there's a poem about you in it. There's a poem about me in it. And it was kind of, you know, I mean, we're going to publish this and it has poems about, you know, different yeah. people. Yeah. But it, I mean, we just happen to be two of the subjects. I think, to be honest with you, it's a great piece of lit. And I think there has one poem in there, if I may add, Tony, that is a classic. And that is Queen Nancy. I think there Queen hasn't Nancy. been, yeah, yeah. I, think, I don't think there hasn't been anything written before or after in the poets, in the poetry world close to that Queen Nancy. Yeah, it's very well put, very well observed and uh, with a sense of humor, but also with a sense of respect for a tradition that is centennial. And uh, so, um, yeah, that was, that encapsulates uh, some of the other work that we did. Uh, then uh, uh, Irene Blyer and Francisco de Fagunge wanted to do um, a, 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 a tribute to Claude Hewlett, who for so many years uh, put together a symposium on Portuguese studies at, uh, I believe, UCLA, if I'm Correct. not mistaken. Correct. Correct. And uh, uh, Francisco Tafagunji had been uh, uh, attending some of those seminars, and I think he attended UCLA and mm -hmm. uh, uh, knew. Uh, fairly well Claude Hewlett. And so those were attempts to um, to penetrate other areas. We thought that eventually probably the universities and some of the academia would be would be a little bit more interested if we had this mix. And uh, 
some of them knew Claude Hewlett and uh, knew Francisco Tafagunji, and they would be a, a way to penetrate air, uh, to penetrate in those areas that we were not so familiar with, uh, especially the academia. Um, well, those were attempts. Those were just ways of trying. Well, to well I I do it. have one. I do have this. I must share, and I just got it, and it says, and I quote. Um, I'm grateful to Tony uh, Goulart's Portuguese Heritage Publication of California for, for publishing so many fine books regarding Portugal and the Portuguese American experience, including Tradições Portuguesas, uh, Portuguese Traditions in honor of Claude Hewlett. That contains uh, one of my essays, and that's from Dr. David Ross, uh, who is following us. And I thanks David for the nice comment. Uh, uh, and uh, he's always very, very supportive. Uh, and I think he has the entire collection of Portuguese heritage publication books at home. Yeah, yeah, he has been always very supportive. And uh, and so the, the the experience the other day, the other day someone was asking me. Uh, what was the most disappointing experience that you've had uh, since Portuguese heritage is base, basically on a dissolution path at this point? Um, was it worth uh, what, what is worth the effort of uh, uh, invested in the time to, uh, to coordinate these, uh, this research and to work on the books, design them and so forth. It was not a disappointment. It was a very gratifying experience, just as well as the Portuguese uh, Chamber of Commerce. Um, but uh, as we were talking off the air a little while ago, uh, everything has its time and its place. And I think it's time for us to also um, realize that the energy and the people that pushed us, that, that, uh, that gave us the incentive to, to publish books. Uh, I remember especially the work the, the work that uh, Lionel Goulart, the late Lionel Goulart and his wife did by going to every single nook and cranny in small cities, taking the books and trying to sell them and trying to introduce them to different people. Uh, we lost those people. And, uh, and the board of the Portuguese chamber, uh, I mean, the, the Portu Portuguese heritage, uh, um, to be corrected, um, is is getting older and the energy is not there anymore so um uh it was a fun experience very um very re rewarding at the same time um it has come to the time that we we must just pass on the baton to somebody else hopefully to uh institute and uh, the fresno uh, uh the fresno university to well, we can only do so much, we can't do half of what you did. Uh, but, um, uh, Tony, a, a couple of things about, uh, uh, um, first of all, um, the, the experience of, 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 of also publishing uh, some of the authors in Portuguese, that was kind of a um, utopian in a way, because uh, Portuguese books, unfortunately, don't sell well in California. I think, the, shall we, am I safe to say that that the success of Portuguese heritage publications, um, uh, California, besides, of course, the themes that, it, that, that were chosen, uh, was also that the books were published in English, so it, it got to a wider audience. Oh, definitely. There's no question about it. And I don't think that we have engaged into this, uh, this uh, we, we've not have embarked into this adventure, was it not? with the idea of uh, leaving a, a legacy that was more accessible uh, to the future generations or the ones that will to our uh, to our children and grandchildren uh, as a reference um, to publish in portuguese was not ever a, a key factor in Portuguese heritage publications. As we saw the difficulty, I remember um, Adrian Alston one time sending me a newspaper clipping, if I could translate it for her, because she, uh, she was researching uh, Joe Costa. Um, 
a, mu a musical conductor that had uh, established several uh, musical uh, marching bands in California at the turn of uh, the 20th century, and she couldn't read it anymore. She she didn't know what the, the, the subject was. She knew exactly what she was looking for because it was an article written by Arturo Avila about his dear friend that had just passed away. It was a, a final tribute on a local newspaper. She knew uh, what the, 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 the title was, but she could no longer uh, understand it. And uh, that's the frustration and that's part of our uh, saga is that we have uh, we have great works collected by our dear friend, late uh, uh, Carlos Almeida at the J. Freitas Library. But who's researching it? Who's uh, capable of, uh, of going through the newspapers and through the microfilm that he so hard uh, worked to have compiled and accessible? And um, now it's almost lost cause. Uh, yeah, it's it's not an easy thing. And sometimes people say, well, maybe there's some students that can do it. But um, in today's world, and as you said, even in, in in a few years ago, when you were going to school, you got sick of being broke, <laughs> yeah. you know, to quote you, you know, and, and I think students' uh, education, of course, is much more expensive today. And students really are looking for a way out. They don't want to take an extra two years in researching something that then there's no way for them to see any money i mean to survive us even you know yeah. uh within yeah. that so it, it, it's going to be tough uh, so how do you we, look at that future research that you so did, did and the we, team did for 20 years we did the comp we did those compilations of those books and i think they're reference uh, reference i was uh whenever I write in English, and um, which is not that often, uh, especially if I have to do a formal presentation like I will be doing in a couple of weeks at the Mon Monterey uh, Whale, uh, Whale Fest uh, um, 2022 edition um, regarding shore whaling. Uh, because uh, David Bertin is uh, is unavailable to uh, to do the presentation, um, but I was um, I was asking my daughter to uh, just uh, check uh, the text that I was uh, preparing to present at this whale fest on the on, on March twentieth in Monterey, and uh, she was reading through it and uh, she was saying. Oh my gosh, because I was talking about um, Carmelo Cove and the Carmelito Bay and the crown, the Holy Ghost crown that is at the Carmel Museum and all these things. And she says, I was just there uh, about a month ago at Carmelito Bay and I didn't know that it, this had anything to do with Portuguese history. Um, so there's that, those references that are going to uh, stay published in books. But at the same time, uh, a few years ago, uh, Dartmouth University did, um, did uh, um, uh, the digitalization of a lot of newspapers at the J. Freitas Library. I know that they did uh, uh, an extremely important job because now those uh, files are accessible for the public to search by topic or uh, and they are available, publicly av available. But Carlos Almeida had left also another big, um, big, uh, big piece of information, which is in microfilm. Well, in microfilm, you have to go through every single page of the newspaper in order to find the, to find the subject you're looking for. And hopefully, uh, because Portuguese Heritage Publications uh, is a nonprofit organization and they will have to disperse its funds, which is not a lot, but it is uh, still a considerable amount. Um, by uh, by, uh, uh, we we have to split it among the educational oriented organizations, and that's one of the things that we might consider is trans transferring those files into um, digital uh, accessible files. Um, I was going to ask about that. What about, uh, I mean, uh, I think they're probably mostly with you, I would think. I don't know. I'm, 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 uh, I'm second guessing here. So, you know, forgive me if I'm totally wrong. 
Um, but what about all these digital files that you hi guys have collected through all this work uh, that's that are published in book, but I know that you, uh, for example, when we did our documentary, uh, uh, the Portuguese Americans along the 99 corridor, uh, Portuguese heritage publications through you, uh, facilitated quite a few uh, pictures for us that we've used, as you know, uh, and credit, of course, Portuguese heritage publications of California uh, uh, from the book, the uh, Val Graves' book, from the Portuguese, uh, from the agricultural book, as I call it. Um, uh, is there a plan for this great archive that you have? We 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 have not thought about it, uh, but that's a very good point. Uh, yeah, it's everything is backed up into an external hard drive. And some of the books that we've published have already because they've gone out of print, uh, we have uh, uh, changed them into uh, a PDF format, which is not really the easiest uh, format to follow, but it's it's a record. And uh, so we have the Holy Ghost book, we have all graves book, and we've had some requests uh, for uh, from time to time to duplicate those books on a PDF format for people that want to uh, who want to research them, the, the, those areas. Uh, but that would be uh, an extremely easy task to uh, to do and just leave it on uh, four or five CDs, uh, copies of CDs of each one of the titles and somebody could just, uh, it, it is something that I'll keep in mind and I'll try to, uh, to, um, to well, get, I, I think get it, it needs, done. Because I, think, I think it needs to be uh, uh, the library, J8 Freitas Library or the Portuguese Beyond Borders Institute is very happy to, to house it yeah. um, because uh, we're, we're right now and actually we're doing a little bit different um, uh, a good friend of ours of the Institute, uh, Kathy Mindish Gully, still uh, of the Mindish family from Riverdale that you know of, and um, uh, and related to Al Graves still uh, through his wife and everything. And so, and she's uh, she's been actually doing some research of Portuguese articles. And I wanted to talk to you about this before we go. I know it's been an hour, um, but um, she's been doing some research on um, through the Hanford newspaper, the Hanford Sentinel, the Lamore paper, the uh, and those uh, rural papers as well. And we've been, she's been fi finding fascinating stories that, that these American writers would write about the Portuguese community yeah. in the 1930s and 40s, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Serpa went to Pico and they did this and that. I mean, just fascinating stories of the history and we're collecting, I mean, these are all archived obviously by the newspapers and everything, but uh, we're trying to get everything that's Portuguese related and creating a digital collection at the library at Fresno State that will have this rich story so people don't have to go all over the world to try to find it. You know, everything that has to do with the Portuguese American community. And uh, that leads me to go ahead. You gave me a good idea. And uh, I promise that uh, that uh, you and Fresno State will have a copy of all the digital all the digital copies of the books that we've printed so far, and I'll also make make a point that they will also be delivered to uh, to the J. Freitas Library. Meanwhile, and because we are on our last leg, as a matter of fact, I just picked up uh, seventeen cases of books at the at, at the storage facility. If there's an organization in California that might have interest in uh, getting a case. I'm not talking a unit. I'm talking about a case of 16 books of the Portuguese politicians, uh, and, uh, Portuguese uh, California politicians from our graves or the Whalers book. We will be glad to uh, ship it to them at no cost. That's wonderful. Um... But there is still a lot of research to be done, Tony. I know that, of course, yeah. uh, your team and uh, me included, because I'm in the same age group, we're all getting tired. And um, and somehow we have to find some young people that uh, are willing to take this on in a different manner, probably not with the dedication that you and your team had. Um, but, uh, but, if, but some work still needs to be done, for example, um, you were telling me the other day off of, uh, in, a, in a conversation about the Portuguese bands that existed at the turn of the century when sometimes people in the Portuguese American community think that the Portuguese bands are something of the posh Capulinius generation, but they indeed were not. Uh, these things that we are finding in Portuguese in newspapers about the Portuguese community tells us 
a little bit different community that we had that sometimes we are unaware of in the 1930s and 40s and 50s before the as you put it and 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 historically correct because there's been people saying that there's been three or four waves of immigration to the United to California but I agree completely with you there's been two waves and that was you know the 1800s to 1921 and then that kind of ceased you know because of the act and then the posh coupling uh there's a lot of history before the posh coupling that hasn't been registered right yes definitely and uh when um, when my mind strikes me right, I will probably end up uh, doing the, that inventory of Portuguese bands in California. Not that it will be a complete uh, type of work because we are always in the process of discovering other others, especially in uh, the uh, the earlier part of last of the last century when a lot of Portuguese a lot of bands marching bands uh, were established under uh, fictitious names that are very hard for us to to uh, decipher whether they were Port whether they were Portuguese or not and I remember vividly um, one band that existed in Gastine. Another one in um, um, uh, skips my mind now. Um, the batata dos uh, buhak, 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 and the Portuguese and the band called the youth band of buhak, hmm. and. I would say 99% of the, uh, the the musicians were Portuguese, oh. and we have the names of all these these people when they played for the inaugural of the Church of Buhok um, um, in the I believe in the 1912. Uh, hmm. <laughs> so they have, we have pictures, and it is a very interesting topic, and there are so many other ones that would be worthwhile researching and looking into. Um, I, just, well, I, just, I just don't see a lot of people very interested in, this, in these matters that would yeah, be it's, a little bit more encour encouraging. Yeah, it's an uphill battle. It's an uphill battle, especially because of the way education is. But it would be wonderful to have some master students doing some work in that field. But uh, we're trying, although it hasn't been easy so far. But we'll see. But, Tony, uh, but, if, but if you have a, uh, an uh, music inclined student sure. at uh, at uh, Fresno State that wants to do this work, complete this work on the marching bands. I will surrender all the information that I have <laughs> and all the pictures that I have because really they are fascinating. I, uh, I, I remember that there was in the uh, 1940s, there, there was a band in Stockton, Portuguese band of Stockton. Nobody has uh -huh. ever heard about it. We found in, a, in the Portuguese hall a picture with all the names of the musicians identified. So those nuggets are there they are somewhere uh, but they are just not fairly and easily accessible to uh, to the majority of our people how many of these nuggets because you just mentioned how many of these nuggets do you think that some of these organizations you know especially the halls uh, and these ids's or mandatos that have been around for 100 plus years most of them are at least 100 years old now uh, how many of these nuggets are there that we really need to that that are just waiting for someone to take the time uh, to discover them? Because I think that there are just as you found this one picture, um, there are things in the halls that probably uh, sometimes the people don't even know that they're there. You know, yeah, yeah that, that there are true treasures, and uh, the longer we wait to uh, to in, to take inventory of of, uh, of this information the harder it's going to get because i remember jose raposo a few years ago um uh, talking about um uh, the sausalito holy ghost hall which had been taken over by uh, second and third generation portuguese americans and they were going to throw away all their records because they were written in portuguese um yeah um there's 
There's, there's lots there's still lot to, to be do. done. So, so, do. so, so a call to the younger generation, those who are working on, um, because uh, why not? If you're looking at doing a research project, why not do something in your own identity? And, and obviously, um, I'm sure that you would be more than happy to serve as kind of a liaison, giving him a little bit of a, of, of a background. To. I'd okay. love to. I need something to tangle up with before I drive my wife crazy. <laughs> <laughs> we, don't want, we don't want you to do that. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. I appreciate it very, very much. Thanks for all your work with Portuguese Heritage Publications. As I said to you, and I mean it, no alternative, no, no via outra alternativa, but uh, <clears throat> I... I completely understand. I uh, <clears throat> years ago, and I want uh, uh, a good friend of ours, and I say ours because you knew him well too, which was Father Hul Marta before he retired here from Tulare, and now he's in, in his hometown of Lisbon, enjoying his retirement years as he should. Um, Father Marta once told me about uh, and this had to do with the Portuguese Cultural Center in Tulare that he founded, and that was part of, as you know, when we yeah. did the symposium here and everything else. He once told me as we were discussing. Right before he left, uh, right before he retired, um, uh, and a few of the things with uh, in, in relationship to the Portuguese American community, he says, and I'm going to kind of say it in English, obviously, for those who are following us, he said, Denise, it's best to, to kill something than to let it linger on in its deathbed for years and years and years. So if you ever see an organization that you belong to that there's you know some dilemmas or there's something, it's better to, to do that. So... You know, there is, uh, he, he might be right. I mean, he might be right with, uh, there are, uh, and I'm, this is not, of course, specific to Portuguese Heritage Publications of California, but specific to a lot of our organizations that exist throughout California that are just kind of lingering on and lingering on and lingering on. Do we really, that's uh, something that I, that I struggle with. Are we doing ourselves and the community and the future any good by just lingering this on, you know, yeah, this uh, the service and uh, and basically just draining the energy and the and the support by supporting something that does not no longer has legs to run. Um, but we are attached, and uh, sure. some sure. people, for one reason or another, they just rather yeah. devote themselves to something that, that meant a lot to them in the past, uh, rather than looking forward and uh, like your Bruma publishing at, uh, at Fresno State now, uh, which I, I, I hope that it will be a viable continuation of Portuguese heritage and just take on this role that uh, we no longer feel it's feasible uh, with the people that we have around us. I remember a few years ago, um, a very uh, interesting personality of our community that came to one of our meetings uh, with this suggestion that uh, we were going to sell a lot more books if we turned over. It, it was uh, a youth group uh, led by um, one of our references in this community as of the last couple of uh, couple decades uh, and he says well give me some money and I'll advertise it on Facebook on Facebook and on, on on social media and I promise that in about a month you will have 5,000 likes um, well 5,000 likes don't didn't sell me any books um, sure Sure. So uh, we are also living in a, at a different time where um, people are not so fond of purchasing a book uh, or the majority of people. Uh, they rather circumvent that and go to a quick, quicker search on, uh, on Google and find the information that they need. Uh, but it's not the same thing. Uh, for most of us. No, it's not. And, and one of the things that um, as we get, come to an end is, uh, you know, this Portuguese immigrant week in California. I mean, um, of course, it has, you know, has its ups and downs. And Carlos Almeida, uh, you know, worked tirelessly for this event. I, I remember when I was a teenager. Um, and it's, um, we, we, I would love to see, and maybe it's something that uh, in the last phase of Portuguese heritage publications we could do, which is, I would love to see a didactic, uh, you know, a curriculum packet that we could give to elementary and to secondary teachers and say, listen, during multi during Portuguese Immigrant Week in California, which is this and this, 
um, here it is. You know, here's a didactic packet that you have like three lesson plans. We have so many folks, as you know, with, with in your own family in education, so many Portuguese Americans that have gone into education. And so if we could get some of these folks together with the new technologies and create a packet that people could say, here it is, you know, in a here's a capsule of the Portuguese presence in California from the festers to the dairy industry, to the agriculture, to the whaling. Um, and it could be done. I think that most teachers would welcome that. And it's the only way that we're going to get ourselves present as you have done with, with the book for May on the ish. It's the only way we're gonna get ourselves present in the, in the American mainstream and survive, which is through education. To have something exactly. that teachers can use and teach whether the kids are Asian American or African American or Hispanic American, we all learn about those cultures in multicultural weeks, and we need we don't have enough for the Port of the Portuguese, but there are enough materials. I say, I always say at some some of my colleagues, we can start a Portuguese ethnic studies course because thanks to Portuguese heritage publications, there are enough materials now out there, and you know this for a fact, Tony. Twenty years ago, there were very you know if you wanted to do a course on the Portuguese presence in California, there was nothing published or very few. I yeah, say were, nothing, very few. Uh, August Vaz and a few Correct. other ones, but uh, yeah, Correct. but uh, all this, uh, and just to sum it up, I, I would say we have to also realize that it takes a village to uh, to carry this out. And as long as we just operate in a mode of letting uh, somebody burn out completely, um, uh, and I think we see that uh, we see that with the Portuguese uh, Portuguese at San Jose High. We saw you uh, on the verge also of getting tired and uh, isolated, uh, of being always on the call to uh, to uh, run with the. Yeah, one one man shows are getting old. Yeah, they're getting old, and then they don't have uh, the continue the continuity that mm -hmm. uh, we wish they did, and uh, that the that's the travesty of most of our um, um, community enterprises is that they are based on somebody and not on a cause, and uh, I. Hopefully, some more of our youngsters will take interest on not so much devoting so much time and energy like you and so many others have done. And you but take a little bite, take a little bite uh, yeah. of uh, and a little slice of this major enterprise that we all believed that believed in at one point or another. Tony, thank you so much for uh, all that you've done, and you'll continue to do. And uh, and I'm going to see if I can entice some students to get a hold of you to keep you busy. It's just because it's not it's not because you need to be busy. It's just I don't want to, your wife to go crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. Oh, Take thank care. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you for thank the you. opportunity to thank you. this exchange with you. Appreciate it. Thank you.